The rest of the summer proceeded peacefully, the air filled with the coming November election. All the young Democrats focused on the Negro vote. They put on frequent barbecues for them with a little whiskey thrown in. The planters, too, were busy doing the same thing. J.M. Shamblin seemed to be the most active and evidently became a target of his opponent. It so happened that about sundown on Sunday, August 2nd, Shamblin, having finished reading the Bible aloud to his family, got up from his chair and laid the open Bible on the table. At that very moment, a charge of buckshot fired through the open window struck him. He fell mortally wounded. Not long before, Shamblin had been the only witness to a crime committed by William Caldwell, a Negro on his plantation. Caldwell was accused of stealing cotton. Meanwhile, a letter was discovered. It was crudely written and poorly constructed, scribbled on stationery from the Brahma Bull and Red Hot Bar. The writer of the letter had declared himself a Republican. He severely criticized Shamblin for trying to get the Negro vote for the Democrats. Although it's more likely the letter was written by someone else, unfortunately for Caldwell, Shamblin, before he died, identified the letter as Caldwell. Caldwell was later convicted and hanged in Harris County. The young Democrats, now called Jaybirds, proclaimed in the Houston and Galveston papers, quote, Shamblin's death is laid at the door of the Republicans. The summer of 88 was intense, so much so that the two clubs took on new, the new labels Jaybirds and Woodpeckers. The Young Men's Democratic Club became the Jaybirds, and the Cleveland and Thurman Club the Woodpeckers. The origin of the terms Jaybirds and Woodpeckers apparently originated from Bob Chappelle. He was an old Negro who worked for Henry Red Hot Frost. He would often dance in the streets of Richmond, singing verse after verse, composing them as he sang about the warring silence. During the summer of 88, Richmond became a powder keg. All the white men were wearing their six-shooters. All the white men were, were wearing their six-shooters. And better yet, they kept their Winchesters handy, ready for the incident that might kick off the shooting. In August, a year before the actual battle happened, there was an event that nearly set it off then. The young Democrats or Jaybirds had arranged a barbecue at Pittsville on the 18th. Even though the two groups were becoming mortal enemies, some of the woodpeckers attended. After all, they were Democrats too. Clem Bassett, Dr. H.A. H. Stone, and Dr. Yandel Ferris were members of both clubs, the Young Democrats and the Cleveland and Thurman Club. They were hoping to arrange a white man's ticket acceptable to both groups. Their presence irritated some of the Jaybird purists, especially Henry Red Hot Frost. He aggressively approached Bassett. He threatened to tear off Bassett's badge if he didn't step aside. And at one point, when Judge Parker began extolling the virtues of the Cleveland and Thurman Democrats, J. Bird Henry Frost, the leader of the Young Democrats, challenged him to explain why he even considered himself a Democrat. So with these incidents in Pittsville, and with the raw nerve of Shamblin's murder still throbbing, someone took pot shots at Henry Frost on September 3rd. He had just locked up the Brahma Bull and Red Hot Bar and was on his way home. When he got about 20 feet from his door, Shots rang out. He spent the next couple of months convalescing in a Galveston hospital. And only a few hours after the incident, the Jaybirds found themselves in a tizzy over something else. The deputy tax collector and three Negroes had been arrested and lodged in jail. Some of these hot-tempered Jaybirds wanted to lynch them, but Clem Bassett, J.H.P. Davis, John M. Moore, and P.E. Pearson prevailed on Jaybirds to smooth their feathers. No lynching occurred, and the accused were not indicted. The Jaybirds were frustrated, and their fury grew. Shamblin was dead and Frost wounded. Two Jaybirds fell in one month. That was just too much. There would be no more talking. They would take action. Within two days, 300 of them met in the district courtroom. They passed a resolution to rid the county of the Republican ring, those scallywags who were morally responsible for these heinous crimes. And while they were convening, they also decided to rid the county of certain Negro leaders. They were going after C.M. Ferguson, the district clerk, two teachers, J.D. Davis and H.G. Lucas, a restaurant owner, Peter Warren, and Tom Taylor, the county commissioner from Kendleton, along with his brother Jack. The Jaybirds demanded they leave within 10 hours. After the meeting broke up, heavily armed men rode away as a body in double file to the homes of Negroes living in Richmond to read them the resolution. Charles Ferguson, the district clerk, had already left town, but Davis, too ill, to leave, tried to beg off. They told him to leave town anyway. Only Peter Warren gave him any trouble. When the cavalcade of men reached his house, 
He pointed a gun out of the second story window. Immediately, hundreds of cop guns aimed to aim at him. So he lowered his gun, came down the stairs, and listened to the resolution. Within the 10 hour deadline, Davis, Lucas, and Warren had left Richmond. Next, they wanted to warn the two tailors in Kendleton. It was impractical to send all 300 men, so they sent only 10. When they got there, the tailors resisted. They said, we're not going to leave town until we're packed in our coffins. The Ten men had been instructed not to use violence against the tailors except in self-defense, so they returned to Richmond. Eventually, the tailors left the county and went to Horton. This riddance of their common enemy seemed to quell the political differences between the Jaybirds and the Woodpeckers. So the two groups started to turn their attention to the upcoming election. On September 21, 1888, 300 Jaybirds met at Davis Hall. They drafted a slate of county officials. The ticket was called the Straight Democrat. At about the same time, the Woodpeckers stole away in the new courthouse and created their own ticket of county officials. They called it the Independent Democrat. The Jaybirds were astounded at the news, especially the news that charter members of the Young Men's Democratic Club of Fort Bend County had come out for offices on the Independent Democrat ticket. They were Dr. J.M. Weston, Dr. J.C. Mayfield, and Kyle Terry. Ironically, Terry's action was the only one that they may, have, they may have been able to understand. Not long before, he had demanded assurance from the Jaybird Democrats that his name would be on their ticket, but he failed to get it. But maybe more importantly, he was in love with the daughter of Woodpecker Judge Parker and was trying to curry his favor. In a desperate effort to steal away the black vote and solidify their opposition to the Republicans, the Jaybird Young Democrats offered to split the ticket with the Woodpecker Independent Democrat. Meanwhile, Republican leaders, smelling trouble and fearing more retribution, decided to urge the county Negroes to cast their ballots for the Independent Democrat. The Woodpeckers, knowing this, rebuffed the Jaybird's offer to split the ticket. Now really desperate, the Jaybird suggested the two parties hold joint rallies. This way, the two competing candidates for each office could speak. The truth is, it would give the Jaybirds some badly needed airtime. Surprisingly, the Woodpeckers said okay. However, there was one agreed upon caveat. Everyone would have to stack their pistols and Winchesters outside the door before the rally began. So they hold a joint rally October 19th at Duke, Texas, very near the present-day present Arcola. Things were going fine until Woodpecker Kyle Terry, candidate for tax assessor, spoke. Chairman Finn had introduced him as a friend and Southern gentleman, the son of the famed Confederate hero, Benjamin Franklin Terry. But Terry apparently forgot his manners halfway through his speech. He lambasted his Jaybird opponent, Ned Gibson, viciously referring to him as a paper collar dude, an insult dating back to the War of Northern Aggression. Ned wasn't there, but his brother Walter was. He called out, Ned isn't here, but I'll represent him. Terry's face flushed with anger. He jumped from the platform with a pistol drawn, ready to fire. No one really knows who grabbed his arm to stop him from firing, but someone says it was Clint Bassett. Others say it was an old, former slave from his father's Sugarland plantation who threw his arms around him and said, Mars Kyle, hate yourself. If Baldy Gibson hadn't stacked his weapon, the Jaybird Woodpecker battle might have started then. Wisely, Jaybird Clint Bassett had instructed Woodpecker Judge Parker that there would be no more joint rallies. So now the line in the sand grew more pronounced. The last few days of the campaign grew hotter, each faction confident in victory. Surprisingly, election day was peaceful. But to the Jaybirds, the outcome was a shocker. Every Jaybird candidate lost by an overwhelming majority. The victorious woodpeckers just couldn't help themselves. They foolishly threw more fuel on the fire. For example, Sheriff Barbie, when drunk, would swagger around town declaring, I am the king of the woodpeckers. Other woodpeckers peckers, uh, acted out the same way. But the Jaybirds, not inclined to waste time nursing their wounds or hanging their heads in shame, throw a big party. God knows the social life of Richmond must go on. However, they are careful to invite only Jaybirds and their ladies. About a week later, the woodpeckers, not to be outdone, give an equally elegant affair. Conversely, their list was not limited to woodpeckers alone, but included a few Jaybirds as well. Some Jaybirds tore, tore theirs up, while others defaced theirs. But a few readdressed their invitations and mailed them back and mailed them to black prostitutes across the track. <laughs> <laughs> when Kyle Terry found out about this, he took it as a personal insult, one that would spawn a series of confrontations with the Gibson brothers, Bonnie, James, and Ned, 
that would eventually lead to the Jay Bird Woodpecker Battle. Terry accused Wally Gibson, the brother of his political opponent in the upcoming election, of this outrageous act. Balling responded, whoever accused me is a damn liar. Terry, the big man, knocked Gibson down. Luckily, once again, Gibson was unarmed, but their business was unfinished. They agreed to meet under the Brazos River Railroad Bridge and shoot it out. As it turned out, Sherry Garvey intervened just in time, relieving Terry of his weapon, and a gibson Terry shootout was avoided. Another incident involving Kyle Terry and Ned Gibson occurred later in the year as, the, as Terry was leaving cobbler shop. Ned and James Gibson had seen him go in and were waiting to ambush him. Deputy Mason was nearby. He managed to dive at Terry, knocking him back into the shop away from a bullet fired by James. James thought Terry was dead, but Deputy Mason and Ned wouldn't let him go in to find out. Unfortunately for, for Ned, though, the bullet missed Terry. In June of 1889, Ned, Ned and some friends were in Wharton. Ned was about to testify in a cattle theft. Terry had no interest in the case, but went to Wharton anyway. At about 2 in the afternoon, Ned and his friends left the Fort Hotel and headed down the street. Terry hid inside a saloon. As Ned and his friends passed by, Terry stepped out and emptied both barrels of his shotgun into Ned. He got him in the right arm and mouth. Gibson died three hours later. Terry was immediately arrested and lodged in the Wharton Jail. After this incident, no one in Richmond expected the differences between the Jaybirds and Woodpeckers to end peacefully. Perhaps it was the summer heat. Sometime in July, the two factions entered into an uneasy truce. And somehow they arrived at the conclusion not to loaf about town with Winchesters in hand. Consequently, everybody seemed to find a convenient place for their firearms. The Jaybirds scattered theirs in places of business along Morton Street. Some were stashed at McCoy's drugstore, but most of them were stacked in the corner of the Bronco Bull and Red Hot Bar. The Woodpeckers made the courthouse their arsenal. News began to spread far and wide that all hell was about to break loose in Fort Bend County. So Governor Sol Ross dispatched to Richmond a ranger force of two officers and six privates. When they arrived, Sheriff Garvey told them he didn't ask for rangers and didn't like them taking on his duty. Other than sensing Garvey's resentment, the rangers felt that everything appeared under control. Meanwhile, the young jaybirds were hustling and bustling about, organizing a beach party. They were making arrangements for horses and carriages, tents, and other provisions. Forty persons, including the Mitchells, Gibsons, the Pearsons, Calvin Blakely, Dudley Bell, and others, with their ladies, along with a few older persons as chaperones, left for the beach. Ranger Sergeant Ira Aiden and his accompanying officers breathed a collective sigh of relief as the Jaybird party rolled away. But the woodpeckers had been smelling trouble all along and wouldn't be fooled. They saw the beach party as rude and figured something was about to happen. No one really knows why, but the Jaybirds did rush back to Richmond from their beach party on the morning of August 16, 1889. So now we're back to where we started our story, 6 p.m. Friday, August 16, 1889, and both sides are primed for battle. Little Roby Smith, a Negro girl, crossed the Morton Street to run an errand from Mrs. Newell's to the Moore home across Jackson Street. Jaybird Gil Gibson, standing, parlays to a couple of young ladies in front of the Winston store. His brother, Balming, straddles a large, sorrel horse a little further down the street. At about the same time, Woodpecker's Judge J.W. Parker and Deputy Sheriff W.T. Wade exit the courthouse, mount their horses, and ride down Morton Street towards Parker's home. Having eyed the Gibson brothers, Woodpecker Sheriff T.J. Garvey gets up from sitting in front of McGee's saloon, calls over Parker and Wade and says, I smell trouble. So instead of heading home, Parker and Wade ride to Parker's law office. Parker dismounts, enters the office, opens a metal vault, and secures his Winchester. Next, he and Wade ride back toward the courthouse <coughs> when they see the Gibson brothers riding toward them. As fate would have it, the four men meet at Booten's Corner on Warner Street. Without warning, bark bullets start to fly, and little Roby Smith, caught in the crossfire, falls to the ground. The lifeless body lies in the street. As quick as you can say lickety-split, Bolly Gibson shoots Judge Parker in the back. Parker digs his spurs into his horse and gallops towards the courthouse at a fast and frenzied pace. The Gibson brothers follow in hot pursuit, exchanging shots with Parker along the way. 
Meanwhile, Deputy Wade dismounts. Volney shoots at him but misses. Wade begs Volney not to shoot, pleading they are kin. The initial shots had been heard all the way down at the other end of the street. Jay Bird started grabbing their Winchesters and rushing out of the Brahma Bull and Red Hot Bar. Others of them stream out from various establishments along Morton Street. The preeminent Henry Red Hot's Frost, like an avenging demon, leads his excited phalanx of men. They head directly toward the courthouse, weapons drawn, ready for a shootout. Fellow Jaybirds, Baldy and Gilt Gibson, join them just moments after chasing Parker back into his woodpecker hole at the courthouse. Every Jaybird in hearing range knows what's happening. Whether they like it or not, today is the day of reckoning. Will McFarlane rushes home, snatches his Winchester, and joins the Jaybird advancing, the Jaybirds advancing up Wharton Street towards the courthouse, where City Hall stands today. The Rubley Pearson exits his father's law office in the Frost Building, towing his Winchester and a six-shooter. He takes up a position behind an old boiler lying near the courthouse square. Clem Bassett at home hears the shots and hoofbeats, looks out an upstairs window, and witnesses Judge Parker riding hell-bent toward the courthouse. Jeff Bryan is enjoying, a, is enjoying a bath when he hears the shots. He, wasting no time, and pardon the expression, naked as a jaybird, <laughs> Slips into a duster, finds his six-shooter, exits the street ready for battle all within a couple of minutes. Other jaybirds join Pearson around the old boiler. On the other hand, many jaybirds stay home, tucked away safely in their nests. Children playing in the streets, fleeing from <coughs> home in fear. As Frost leads the jaybirds along Morton Street towards the courthouse, deputies Mason and Smith join Sheriff Carver and approach it, just in time to witness Judge Parker fall from the saddle and say, the cursed jaybirds have assassinated me. A lot of them are coming up the street with guns. Let's go down and stop them. Frustrated, he calls on Mason and Smith to speed it up. Judge Parker drags himself to the courthouse, Garvey and Wade not far behind. Judge J.M. Weston, also a doctor and already in the building, hastily inspects Parker's wound. Deputies Mason and Smith quickly join their fellow woodpeckers in the confines of the courthouse. 